there is something supremely satisfying and a bit nostalgic in reading classic thriller novels. It doesn't matter if it's the annoyingly optimistic enthusiasm of Americans in Tom Clancy's The Hunt for Red October. <laughs> You wish to add something to our discussion, Dr. Ryan? For our Patriot game. Sir, Jack. Lady Catherine. The charmingly pessimistic defeatism of the British in Jean Le Carré's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy or Stella Remington's At Risk or even the arrogant sophistication of the French in La Femme Nikita. I, I know that one's a movie and not a book, but my high school French is extremely rusty, so give me a break. Even the tongue-in-cheek dark humor in The Tailor of Panama or Our Man in Havana, which really seem to be the same story, reminds me of my first foray into the genre. Sometimes I even get to experience combinations of these archetypes, such as the annoyingly optimistic American and defeatist Brit in Graham Greene's The Quiet American. I met Pyle, where you meet everybody, at the Hotel Continental. I'm there every morning at 11. I'm English. I have habits. I drink tea. I'm a reporter, so I listen. I have a lover. I like to watch her arrive with her friends at the milk bar. And there was Alden Pyle, a face with no history and no problems. The face we all had once. I'm Alden Pyle. I'm Thomas Fowler. The London Times. Which I reviewed previously in my blog, the link in the description below. The classics seem fresh, nuanced, with rich, full characters that are multifaceted and contradictory. Newer forays into the genre seem cliched or formulaic. Even the newer pieces by the classic authors fall prey to this issue. Formula and cliché make it easier, of course, for the publisher to continue the series long after it's jumped the shark. Publishers even manage to milk characters in literary universes long after the death not only of the author, but also of the aforementioned shark the author jumped. All you have to do is peruse your local bookstore, assuming you have one, or the digital catalog of your favorite e-reader to see the ongoing saga of the Ryan clan from the Tom Clancy novels, or the continuing adventures of Jason Bourne. Both series have had a dozen novels written since the death of their creators, and the Jack Ryan stories had five that were collaborations. Additionally, we cannot ignore the dozens of stories chronicling the ongoing adventures of James Bond, decades after the death of Ian Fleming, his progenitor. Well, this is not to say reading these stories cannot have some enjoyment. I admit, I still have fun going to see a James Bond movie, and in my youth, I read stories from the expanded universes of both Doctor Who and Star Trek. It's just they're isn't anything fresh or intriguing about them. They are of better use as a refreshing mental palate cleanser than a more nutritious and tasteful main course. Like any menu item, it also helps to get your stories as fresh from the source as you can. Nick Marlowe, the protagonist of Cause for Alarm, is an out-of-work engineer during the months leading up to the beginning of World War II. Even worse than just being let go by his previous firm, he has also just gotten himself engaged as well. The pre-war, post-depression economic environment threatens not just his immediate life, as he slowly uses his savings looking for a job in England, but his future. How can he possibly marry if he can't afford to keep his own flat in London? He cannot take just any job either. He is getting married, so he needs to be able to support his wife, and he's a middle-class Englishman, for goodness sake. Finally, though, he finds himself with little choice and agrees to be the managing engineer in the Italian office of a British firm. This is less of a break than first anticipated by our hero. Nick soon learns someone has killed his predecessor, his office manager is incompetent, corrupt, and working for the Italian secret police, the brother and sister American couple occupying the office below his may in fact be Russian spies, 
and the local Yugoslav liaison officer is actually a German spy sent to keep watch on the Reich's so-called ally. This leads Nick to being pummeled by Italian thugs and a desperate revenge-induced plot to spread disinformation and sour the budding Axis collaboration. Hijinks, as you might imagine, ensue. Said hijinks culminate in a desperate flight across the High Julian Alps to cross from fascist Italy into what was then Yugoslavia. At first glance, this story appears to be just bursting at the seams with cliché. The concepts seem like tropes, and there is a slight whiff of the two-dimensionality in the character sketches. That is the wonderful revelation when reading early Ambler. Much like the plot of the story itself, none of your expectations is met. The plot moves along at an exciting pace. The motivations are believable, if slightly outside the ordinary. And the characterizations are fresh and memorable. The initial description of the Yugoslav general cited often as one of the most unique descriptions in the genre. All of this makes for a completely new experience. Yet at the same time, everything feels familiar. Eric Ambler's Cause for Alarm was only the fourth novel he wrote back in 1936, publishing it in September of 1938, and considered remarkable for its prophetic tone. Most of us in the 21st century forget, to the average person in 1938, World War II wasn't inevitable, or at least so it didn't seem. In fact, even those who saw the specter of war barreling toward them hoped that they'd be able to shift its track to avoid it. The settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem which has now been achieved is, in my view, only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. Cause for Alarm, therefore, not only proved itself as a prophetic glimpse into the near future, but also laid the groundwork for the thriller and noir genre we recognize, know, love, and wind you over when you so poorly today. Thank you.